While working on my DIY chemical fume hood project, I needed a smoke generator to test fume extraction, which in turn required control of a DC powered fan. The DIY chemical fume hood will be a future video, so subscribe if you'd like to know when it becomes available. Of course I could have just purchased a motor speed controller from eBay. You can get them just for a few dollars. But I didn't want to wait the six weeks or more for the thing to arrive. Making your own basically just needs a 555 timer and a few discreets, which likely you have in your parts bin in any case. So this can easily be finished in a day, could even cost less than the eBay item, and gives the opportunity to customise to your particular need. More fun building your own anyway. The actual circuit is the typical 555 timer in a stable configuration. The values of resistor R1 with the potentiometer and capacitor C2 determine the output frequency. Having a potentiometer instead of a fixed resistor enables changing the duty cycle and the two diodes D1 and D2 enable a duty cycle of less than 50%. I won't repeat how the 555 timer itself actually works, plenty of info on the web already about this but there is a link in the description which I think gives a good explanation. For the MOSFET, I used an IRF540N simply because that's what I had on hand, but it can handle up to 20 volt VGS 30 amp source current and has an RDS on in the milliohm range. Before I show a practical example of component value selection, using this breadboard circuit and a computer fan, a few points about the circuit component values from the 555 timer datasheet. Due to the internals of the 555 timer, the datasheet recommends R1 to be a minimum of about 5 kilo ohms. In a stable configuration, the value of R2, which in this case is a potentiometer, should be a minimum of 3 kilo ohms to ensure oscillation. The value of capacitor C2 depends upon your desired output frequency and your chosen values of R1 and R2. The equation is given in the datasheet with many online calculators available for this. Having a frequency above about a kilohertz, you will likely start producing an annoying whine or whistle from the motor. In order to test the circuit and experiment a little with the component values, the output from pin 3 of the 555 timer is connected to the oscilloscope, which will show frequency and duty cycle, while the drain of the MOSFET pin 2 is connected to a digital voltmeter to monitor the effective voltage given to the load, in this case a 12 volt computer fan, which is also monitored with a digital tachometer to show RPM of the fan. This setup will also help explain how the PWM signal from the 555 timer, which is a square wave with a relatively set frequency due to R1 and C2, but with the duration of the high and low portion being controlled by the potentiometer, actually controls the speed of the motor. The signal from the 555 timer pin 3 is connected to the gate or pin 1 of the MOSFET, Q1 in the schematic, which means when the portion of the square wave is high, the MOSFET conducts and the motor is able to draw current. Hence varying or modulating the pulse width, that is the high portion, you can control the amount of time per cycle the motor draws current, which when combined with doing this pulsing rapidly over time, with the mechanical momentum of the motor when not actually powered, gives a type of average voltage that results in the same effect as if you'd actually decreased the voltage to the motor, and thereby controlled its speed. However, because the full voltage, for example 12 volt from a 12 volt rated fan, is always been applied while the pulse is high, the motor will still operate just at a slower speed, whereas if you'd only applied for example 5 or 6 volts continuous, the motor would likely not even start. This means however that the pulse width modulation for a particular motor and the amount of control over the speed will be dependent somewhat upon the frequency of the PWM signal in conjunction with the characteristics of the motor. This potentially affects the component values of R1, C2 and the potentiometer. For example, with 100 nanofarads for capacitor C2, which with the 5K for resistor R1 and the 10K potentiometer, they have a PWM frequency in the range of 1000 Hz. With the test 12 volt computer fan, this gave a stall speed of about 200 RPM and an apparent applied voltage of about 2.5 volts. Whereas with a value of 340 nanofarads for capacitor C2, the circuit could now get reliable speeds down to about 100 RPM and an apparent applied voltage of about 1.5 volts. This table collates the results of varying the value for capacitor C2 and the effect on stall speed with the range of RPM that could be achieved with the 12 volt fan tested.
like I said at the start, a benefit of DIY building your own is that you can mod and add whatever features desired. This is the final circuit schematic used. The basic 555 timer circuit is the same, but note the following mods. I allowed a 2 pin socket for capacitor C2 instead of the capacitor being soldered to the board. This will enable changing the capacitor later if a different PWM frequency is required to better suit a particular motor. I was also planning on powering the circuit and any attached motor with either a battery or a wall wart, in my case a power brick from an old discarded laptop. So the circuit provides a jumper, I scrimped on using an actual switch, enables switching between battery or the AC adapter. Since the 555 timer has a maximum voltage input of 16 volts, and I was planning on using an AC adapter that could provide up to 20 volts, I incorporated a Zener diode and limiting resistor to provide a rough voltage regulator to the 555 timer. You could replace this with a linear voltage regulator IC, such as the LM7805 or similar if you like. Finally, added a LED to provide a positive indicator that the circuit was receiving power. This board schematic shows the final layout with the components and associated jumper wires. I just used an offcut of some Vero board instead of making a PCB, as this is likely to be a one-off, only has about a dozen components, and I wanted to be able to finish as quickly as possible. This basic layout can be easily changed to suit your own connectors, style of DC input socket, etc. Housing the circuit will obviously depend upon your application. I wanted a standalone unit, and since I have a 3D printer, used Fusion 360 to make a custom enclosure. The design incorporates embossed lettering to signify functions and cutouts for the potentiometer, DC power adapter, and the external connections. There is a groove slot internally which allows mounting the circuit board without the need for fasteners and this enables the circuit to be easily removed if necessary, for example to change the value of capacitor C2 and all the link for changing the power source to either battery power or via the DC plug adapter. The lid allows mounting of the power switch and is a snap fit and remove type design. The STL files for the enclosure are on my website for download for those of you that might find this design useful. The final step is soldering the various components onto the Vero board. There is no particular order that the components should be installed. One thing of note is that I use an 8 pin socket for the 555 timer IC instead of soldering it direct to the Vero board. This allows it to be easily removed if necessary and it is also less likely to be damaged during soldering. I'll fast forward through the rest, both not to waste your time and to hide my lack of skill. Just need to now install the circuit board into the enclosure and hook it up to the power supply and the motor to be controlled. Well that's about it. If you found this useful and or interesting, please like, comment and or subscribe.